Thank you very much, William. We're going to move on now to the next uh, presentation, um, which is about the testing of oil recovery skimmers um, in ice um, at the OMSET facility. And this paper is uh, presented by Paul Mayer. Paul is the OMSET manager for the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, BESI, their, their oil spill response division. OMSET is the National Oil Spill Response Research and Renewable Energy Test Facility. As the government's technical representative overseeing the contractor op operating OMSET, Paul has the responsibility for every facet of the facility, from working with researchers interested in using the, the facility, um, to ensuring that the tank is uh, properly maintained and managing um, the upgrades needed to expand the uh, facility's capabilities. Prior to accepting his appointment at Bessie, Paul was a test engineer at OMSET. He is a graduate of the University of Cincinnati with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and North Carolina State University with a Master's in Environmental Engineering. Good morning, every Good morning everyone. <clears throat> As you can imagine, um, this is a collaborative effort. I'd like to acknowledge a few people who helped out with this project. Uh, Bill Schmidt and his staff at the OMSET facility, Steve Potter, S.L. Ross, and also the manufacturers who supplied the equipment as well as the United States Navy and the United States Coast Guard who also supplied equipment and personnel to help this effort. Um, OMSET is the National Oil Spill Response Research and Renewable Energy Test Facility. Our mission is to improve oil spill response through testing, training, research, and development. Those of you who haven't visited the facility, we're an hour south of New York City. We're right on Sandy Hook Bay. And this is our largest asset. It's the OMSET test tank. It's, it's 667 feet long, 65 feet wide. We run an operating depth of eight feet of water. The water is open ocean salinity, roughly 30 to 35 parts per thousand. And we also have three movable carriages that can move up and down the tank. It speeds up to six knots so we can tow equipment through the tank. At the south end of the tank, we have a wave generator which can generate waves up to three feet high both sinusoidal waves as well as more complex Pearson, Moskowitz, and Joms lots of waves. And we also have a beach system at the north end of the tank. This helps us shape the waves, whether it's a sinusoidal wave, a breaking wave, non-breaking wave, so it helps us control it. So OMSET's role in standards development, OMSET collaborates with other organizations to help develop and improve standards. These organizations include the ASTM F20 Subcommittee on Oil Spill Response, as well as the United States Coast Guard. Um, in the winter of 2013, we wanted to do a mechanical response equipment test in drift ice conditions. Um, we wanted to evaluate the equi equipment, and this wasn't to see what was the best each individual piece of equipment could attain. This is sort of a top level, sort of a, an overall view of how well the performance was in two ice conditions, 30% ice and 70% ice. So it was a baseline for performance um, potential improvements, as well as a basis for developing future oil spill test standards. So <clears throat> to develop their test plan, we looked at several of the ASTM test protocols, F2709 and F631. Um, part of the standard said that you should have a test area that's at least three times wider and three times longer than the largest skimmer. We came up with a test area that's 25 by 42. For a test oil, we considered using a crude oil such as ANS. However, there were a couple of complications with this. One was the safety of our workers working with um, the light ends in that. Also, the viscosity of ANS changes considerably. If you have fresh ANS, you might have viscosity of something in the order of 50 centipoise. If it's weathered and, and you have 30% weathered, you may be talking the viscosity of 4,000 centipoise. So that was just too much variability between the skimmer test. We wanted something that was a little more controllable. We went with a HydroCal 300 um, at test temperatures, which are near freezing temperatures, which were what our test tank was. We have a viscosity of roughly 1,000 centipoise, which is in the realm of what ANS would be if it was in a weathered state. And the measurements we were interested in, in looking at were the oil recovery rate and the recovery efficiency. As I mentioned, we looked at two different ice concentrations. On the left was a 30% ice concentration. On the right is 70% ice concentration. The reason we picked these two particulars is 30% um, from previous research done by others seems to be the threshold where you start to see the effects of the ice. Below 30%, the skimmers can move within the ice field. The oil flows within the ice flows. Once you reach 70%, however, the ice becomes such an impediment, both to skimmer motion and the oil flow, that it becomes a significant impediment. So we chose those two extremes to test. 
Um, for an oil thickness layer, we chose, we wanted to choose the, uh, the thinnest oil slick that we could repeat. Now, when oil spills out in the open ocean, it spreads to a very thin layer. The th belief is that when it's in an ice field, it can be a thicker layer because the ice is impeding the motion of the oil, and also because the cold temperatures increase the viscosity. The thinnest slick that we thought we could get away with was about a one inch layer. Um, we also have wind effects to consider, so we also picked a one inch. And then the ideal is that we're going to allow the skimmer to remove roughly one third of the oil that's in that field. At 30% ice concentrations, we have roughly 450 gallons of oil in there, so we're going to try and remove 150 gallons, or at the end of 15 minutes, that's when we call time for the, for the skimmer. Um, what we did was we're going to let the skimmer come up to speed. We're going to collect that into a slop tank, basically. Once we have steady state conditions, we're going to switch over to a collect tank. That's when we're actually going to start our collection time. Again, we're going to run the skimmer until it's recovered 150 gallons. Um, or the 15 minutes is left, we're going to stop time and go back to the slop tank. What we're going to do is we're going to take initial measurements on how much fluid we've actually recovered. We're going to let it settle for 30 minutes. We're going to decant that free water off, take a second measurement. Then we're going to stir that, take a representative sample, send that to our on-water, on-site oil water lab to um, further analyze that to give us the water content in the oil. And from those figures, we can determine what the oil recovery rate is and the oil recovery efficiency is. So these are the two figures we're considered, we're interested in recovery efficiency and oil recovery rate. Recovery efficiency, of course, is the volume of oil divided by the total volume of fluid multiplied by 100 expressed as a percentage. And oil recovery rate is the volume of pure oil divided by unit time expressed as a flow rate. Now we looked at 10 different skimmers. Again, to remember this is not the absolute best that each skimmer can do. We sort of wanted to get a cross section of what the different kinds of skimmers would do in 30 and 70 percent ice. The first skimmer was a JBF DIP 400 skimmer. This is the only skimmer that's designed um, ex exclusively for advancing conditions. You have to advance roughly at one knot to recover oil. One problem we were concerned with in, with this skimmer is that there's no cage in front of the mouth of the skimmer. and We were concerned that oil was going to collect there and inhibit the oil flow to the skimmer. Indeed, this was the case. The second skimmer is, a, is the Desmi rope mop skimmer. The way this works is you have dangling ropes um, of, that rotate down, they go through the oil water interface, oil clings to the ropes, they come back up here to this ringer up here, the oil is wrung off, collects in a sump and then is offloaded to the pump system, to the recovery tanks rather. The next skimmer is a Lawyer, Lori Mini uh, floating brush wheel skimmer. The way this works is that the, it's a wheel with brushes, oil filled brushes, the oil, the brushes rotate through that oil water interface, oil adheres to the brushes. It's scraped off to into a sump. Fluid that's collected in the sump is pumped up to the recovery tanks. The next skimmer is Elastec X30. This is a groove disc. Um, it's not just a plain disc, but the discs actually have grooves that are cut into them. This increases their surface area. Again, the disc is rotating through that oil water layer. Oil collects in the grooves. It's scraped off to into a sump, and it's pumped from the sump into the recovery tanks. As you can see, not all these skimmers, as a matter of fact, very few of the skimmers were actually designed for Arctic conditions. This is sort of a baseline conditions. One of the problems that not only the Elastec but other skimmers ran into is that you had ice that brushed up against the disks, and this actually not only impeded the flow of oil to the disks themselves, but it also had a tendency to actually wipe the uh, oil off the disks with brushes or whatever is actually contacting the oil. The next two skimmers were also by Elastic. These are drum skimmers. Again, they're using the groove technology. The drums are rotating through that oil water interface. Oil is adhering to the drum. It gets scraped off. It's collected into a, the sump and then pumped up to the oil collection tanks. They brought both a two drum and a four drum system. Next skimmer is the Lemoore LRB 150. This is a brush wheel, wheel skimmer. Again, we're going to have brushes which are going to rotate through that oil water interface. What's interesting about this is that you can mount it either on an excavator or on a crane as you would in the ship. And then you're actually going to brush that across the top of the oil to recover oil. Lemoore also brought their oilophilic brush conveyor belt skimmer. This is a, a, brushes on a conveyor belt that are actually rotating through that oil water interface as well. Again, it's collecting in the sump and being pumped up to the recovery tanks. And the last two skimmers were by, by um, Desby. The Desby Helix is basically a Weir skimmer, which has a helix brush adapter, which turns it into a brush skimmer. Again, the brushes are going to rotate through that oil water interface. And they also brought their Desmi Polar Bear skimmer, which is also a brush wheel, wheel skimmer. This particular one is designed for Arctic conditions. Um, 
We did have a very ambitious test schedule. We were going to try and test all 10 skimmers in two ice conditions with one oil, so that's a lot of tests, in four weeks. So it didn't allow a whole lot of time for the manufacturers to really to optimize their skimmers. Desney had a little trouble rigging their um, polar bear skimmer. Um, they have a cantilevered offload pipe, pipe um, which we couldn't support fully, so they had a little bit of trim issues, so they weren't actually able to get maximum efficiency out of their, the uh, Desney polar bear unit. I have a few videos I'd like to show you now, um, sort of a sampling of what the skimmers were up against. This first one, this is a Desney Helix skimmer. This is in a 70% ice conditions, and you can see just by looking at it um, that it's going to be limited to how much oil it's actually going to see. And one thing we saw, we initially started with a one-inch layer across the entire surface of this. What we saw during recovery is that the, the skimmers would recover all the oil in that immediate vicinity until they were down to almost bare oil, so there was just clear water. But less than 20 feet away, we saw that there was still one inch of oil, so the oil was actually being impeded by the ice. I'd like to go ahead and run that video. So you can see the, the um, brushes are rotating. In a minute, you're going to see the uh, oil collecting in the center portion of that, the sump. So oil is being collected in the center of the sump, and then it's going to be offloaded by a, an offload pump up to the recovery tanks. The next skimmer I'd like to show you is the rope mop skimmer. This um, actually worked fairly well in both the 30% and 70% because it didn't have the availability issues that the other skimmers had. The difficulty this skimmer had was that the ropes are so light that if they land on the ice flows, they tend to just rotate on the ice, so you have to sort of move the skimmer around until you actually find oil. But once you find, actually do find oil, um, it does actually a pretty good job. This is actually in 70% ice conditions. You can see it's having a little bit of difficulty at the beginning here, but then once it finds oil, it's able to stay in that region and actually did a pretty good job of recovering oil. And then the third skimmer, the final skimmer I'd like to show you, this is the Lemoore bucket skimmer. Um, this is going to rope, this is going to brush across the, uh, the oil interface. And one thing to note is that there was definitely a learning curve with this. I'm going to show you the results a little bit later and you'll see how much better the operator did just after a few runs. So it emphasizes the importance of operator training. One thing to note is that this is um, the large, probably one of the heavier, the larger skimmers, so it has the mass and the bulk actually sort of muscle its way around the ice field. Now I'd like to go into some of the results. Again, that caveat that this wasn't trying to optimize each one of the skimmers. We're just sort of trying to get a, a first cut for how well the skimmers did in rough conditions. The JVF was that advancing skimmer that we talked about. Again, what we mentioned was this skimmer actually needs forward momentum to actually recover oil. Its target speed is one knot. However, we did see during the testing that oil did collect in front of the inlet, the mouth that did block the flow of oil to it. The first numbers was this was tested in 30% ice. The speed was one knot. Its oil recovery rate was just under four gallons per minute, and it had a very low recovery efficiency as well at that speed. And that was conditions, roughly 14%. We backed the speed down from one knot down to, to uh, 0.35 knot. The oil recovery rate, again, dropped to um, just a little over one gallon per minute, primarily because it had so much blockage in front of the inlet. And then we went back up a little bit in speed to try and clear some of the ice. We bumped it up to a half a knot. The recovery rate did go up to almost nine, it went a little over nine gallons per minute, roughly 28% recovery efficiency. Because of the problems that it had in 30% ice conditions, we decided not to test it in the 70%, so it would give us more time to test the other skimmers. Next skimmer is this Desme CMOP that we talked about. In 30% conditions, we saw it roughly um, between 8 and 9.5 and gallons per minute for the oil recovery rate. Its recovery efficiencies in 30% ice were between 70 and 84%. And then once we went to the 70% ice, we saw the recovery rate drop a little bit, drop down into the sixes between 6.5 and, and 8. And its recovery efficiency stayed pretty well. It was in 60 and close to 72 recovery efficiency. This was the skimmer that was affected the least by the 70% ice. The next skimmer is that Lori Mini Skimmer. This is the brush wheel, wheel skimmer. In 30% ice, we saw oil recovery rates from 5 um, gallons per minute up to, eight, up to 11 
gallons per minute. The oil recovery rates were a little bit on the low side. They were 38 to 55 percent. But look at the difference between the 30 percent and 70 percent. The oil recovery rate drops from eight down to roughly two gallons per minute. The next skimmer, the X30, um, did fairly well in the 30 percent ice coverage. Had an oil recovery rate that was in the teens, roughly between 12 and 16 gallons per minute. Fairly high oil recovery rate between 60 and um, 80 percent. That 60 percent low one was. Um, they were spinning the disc a little bit faster once they slowed the disc speed from 35 RPMs down to 26. That improved the recovery efficiency, and they were up in the, around the 80 percent realm. But one thing to note is that once we go from the 30 percent range down to 70 percent, the recovery rate, as in most of the other skimmer, drops dramatically. It goes from the teens to low teens to two. Um, its recovery efficiency still stayed very well. It was um, 79 percent. So again, we're seeing the effect of that 70 percent ice coverage. With the drum skimmers, the Elastec. Uh, 118, this is a two drum, um, groove drum, in 30% ice. We had oil recovery rates which were in the mid 20 range, they were 21 to 25 gallons per minute. Had a fairly high oil recovery rate of um, 66 to 74 percent. For the 70% ice, we saw those rates drop by an order of magnitude. So they went from basically 23, 25 gallons per minute down to around 20, down to 2.6 to uh, 3 gallons per minute. The recovery efficiency did stay fairly high, though, 82 to, to 91 percent, but we are seeing the effects of that 70 percent ice. The Elastec Magnum 100 is the four drum. We saw the uh, oil recovery rates from the uh, 38 to 43, and then again, when we went to the 70 percent ice, it dropped by an order of magnitude to, 35, to uh, three and a half. The Lemoore LRB, um, this is, we're seeing the operator improve the performance. They started out at 19. And after four runs, they increased that to 61 gallons per minute. But then when they dropped to the 70 percent, that went from 60 gallons per minute down to six gallons per minute. Uh, the Lemoore LAM uh, 50, this is a conveyor brush skimmer. Again, we saw the oil recovery rates in the range from four to six. And then when we went to 70 percent ice, it dropped down to around two. The Desby Helix, again, we're seeing oil recovery rates in 30 percent ice running from 27 to 45. When we jump up to 70 percent, we see those drop by uh, close to an order of magnitude. It drops down to five. And then Desby Polar Bear, this is the one that had a little difficulty rigging, um, but they did see oil recovery rates in the realm of 41 gallons a minute. And when we dropped that down to 70, when we increased to 70 percent ice, that dropped from 41 roughly to 10 gallons per minute. So some conclusions. Um, in 30 percent ice, ice does interfere with, the, interfere with the flow of oil to the skimmer. Um, however, there's no real significant impediment either mechanically or for the oil flow. Once we hit the 70 percent, though, we did see significant impediment flow to the skimming. We saw dramatically lower rates. This was a little less so for the CMOP, but most of the other skimmers saw dramatically orders of an order of magnitude less at 70 percent. And some suggestions, um, if they put debris guards ahead of the active skimming um, components, this can keep the ice away from the discs and the brushes, um, which had a tendency to wipe the oil off. Um, also, the brushes ten have a tendency to pick up small bits of ice, which ended up in the sump, which has the potential of clogging their, their um, pumps. So they might want to put ice guards actually in the sump to uh, act as filters. And it also highlighted the importance of operator training. We saw that the operators, with a little bit of experience, improved their efficiencies fairly substantially. So that's our presentation today. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions now. Sir. I was just curious uh, whether you looked at the ice afterwards to see if, uh, if the oil actually was absorbed by the ice at all. Um, not really. The ice, it was, we actually had the Army Corps of Engineers actually make 9,000 square feet of sea ice for us. Um, so any ice that basically adhered or attached to the ice actually melted and ended up back in the water column. And then to ensure that we still had those 30 and 70 percent ice concentrations, when we put the ice into the tank, we did it geometrically where we had roughly 55 percent full blocks, 40 inches by 40 inches. We had roughly 30 percent quartered ice, and then the rest was basically the ice rabble. And then throughout the day, we were actually taking digital photographs, um, changing those photographs into black and white. The ice was white, the oil is black. And then we used um, Photoshop to actually digitize and count pixels. So that told us that we still had the 30 percent and 70 percent ice concentrations, and we added ice throughout the day. So we really didn't have to be concerned with the oil actually adhering to the ice. Yes. 
Hi, Victoria Brajevishal. I was just curious if you thought about normalizing this in any, any way, because it's interesting to see per schema recovery, but comparing two drum schema to four drum schema, you know, it's kind of uh, not very fair comparison. So is there any way to normalize it per uh, width of the working units or contact length with oil, something that can give a better indication of which approach or technology actually works better because I think for manufacturers it would be useful to know do they need bigger drums, wider drums, mm -hmm. shorter bristles, things like that. Sure. That's pretty much outside the scope of this. We Our main goal was to test as many different kinds of skimmers in a relatively short period of time to sort of get a, a, a brief overview of how the skimmers um, reacted to the different kinds of oils. But that would be a great follow-up test. I think mean, Chris had a question. Hey, Paul. Nice presentation. Hey, I just wanted to ask a question about the rope mop. Did I know it's probably outside the scope is what I'm expecting to hear, but did anybody try weighting the bottom of the ropes? Like a, like a, like so, like a pulley on the like downside? Like yeah. down hold it. We just because, I mean, seeing it, it, it would get, it looks like it would get all tied up on top if you got, if you got it too buggered up there, but if you put a pulley on the bottom, you could pull it right through. Right. But I don't know if they had the time to do that within your scope. Yeah, we had, a, we had 10 skimmers in four weeks. We thought about actually putting a pulley down there and actually having it going right through the oil. But then we're considered that it, it might actually get wrapped around some of the ice as well. So it's six of one half of the other. We did have one condition actually, which actually did happen just like you said. The oil actually, the, the um, ropes actually did coil up on some of the ice blocks and we actually did have a couple tangles. So that is, an, again, an operator training so that they don't actually in, end up in that condition. Any more questions? Right at the back. Right at the back. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, Lieutenant Joseph with the Gulf Strike Team. Have any of these results been compared to the on-water tests that were done on the Healy earlier? Uh, I think it was this year and last year. No. This is this is published. Um, this has been published in a couple of different publications. It's available on our website as well, but we haven't done any direct comparisons. Uh, what were the ambient air and water temperatures during the testing? Um, <clears throat> this was conducted back in February 2013, so the air temperatures were in the 30s and 40s. We actually brought a chiller, a 500-ton tractor-trailer mounted chiller, pumped it into our filtration system to try and maintain that um, water temperature, so the water temperature was actually in the, in the mid-30s. Was there any refreezing of the ice sheet during the testing? No, no. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed.